streaming started sir uh good evening uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, again once again indeed my proud privilege to welcome each one of you to this evening edition of mma and uh, you have been talking all time about management but this topic what you are going to be talking to something unique uh, which is very very relevant in impacting most of us in the society before i call upon the speaker and also introduce the chairman the speaker for this evening let me briefly tell you i'll take a minute to tell you uh, what's happening in mma in next few days so that if you have by any chance missed your inbox mail so that you can mark your diary and make sure that you attend some of the wonderful events we are which you are bringing it to you and i am also happy to share with you that we are indeed delighted by the overwhelming support uh, each one of you shown to us in all our endeavor during the lockdown we are starting our program from morning 9 o'clock till late in the evening uh, starting with the quiz which has got a tremendous response I, i see a lot of people taking part every day in the quiz and very very inspiring there after articles and talks in the evening number of workshops we have also done some phenomenal csi initiative working with number of schools on uh, summer camps and uh, so we are we are keeping ourselves engaged make sure that we also engage uh, our community in a big way so that they don't feel the lockdown pinch during the difficult times coming to some of the quick events i'll take a few seconds uh, next event is happening on the 5th of june is the world environment day and we are going to discuss on the very important theme sustainable development goals uh, uh, 2030 and we got some outstanding panelists uh, as this we are doing it jointly with condor and stifting a couple of our german speaker are talking joining us from berlin so don't miss this event is again very very important very relevant to us today on 7th of june again we have an important uh, impact of marketing and commerce uh, in grassroots level uh, in business again very by lata kumar a seasoned business person going to be talking to us 9th june again we have accelerating digital success uh, again we have an outstanding panelists uh, then on the 11th we have on innovation why innovation not picking up at young minds and how innovation can be really inculcated in the mind of young people to take it for and it's again the panel of young and a child prodigy at the age of 14 is going to be leading the moderating the discussion is child innovator i thought something interesting to see that uh, why youngster not taking innovation now on 16th again we have uh, uh, own your own business uh, by babita barua it's again it's a great event and 29th of june again we have a narayanan endowment lecture we have two outstanding international speakers will be talking to us uh, on that day now coming to today's event um, very very important and uh, the speaker is very very known to us very close to mma but though he's not with us in chennai but still very very close to us oxygen challenge and the way forward and uh, this is one which everybody is discussing i know most of us are really impacted in some way or other i i know at least i used to get couple of call do you know anybody in the office for a bit and uh, in this panel we kept it exclusively uh, to talk only about the oxygen challenge totally related to the thing we bring a medical practitioner to come and share the insight about oxygen because you already have so much of insights on the medical you know insights about the medical requirement of oxygen so many whatsapp so many debates are already gone i know so many things are coming in whatsapp you don't want to really further confuse you i know somebody you take a keep a loving in your thing i think from 92 it goes to 99 so many things i, I know we don't know what really come in the way of uh, whatever you believe as you but ultimately listen to your doctor listen to the professional people who will advise you and uh, and coming to a thing and a very walk, welcome to each one of you we are being joined us this evening by Sage Sinivasan and Ravichandran Purushottaman and uh, coming to today's topic oxygen challenge on the way forward let me have the proud privilege of introducing our distinguished speakers for the this evening Ravichandran Purushottaman uh, uh, i think he doesn't need an introduction he is now the uh, president of Madras Management Association and is also the business leader of over 25 years of experience uh, uh, you got <coughs> he's got experience in all the field marketing strategy general management and much more member of the global management team board a member of the global mentor services active member of ca and number of activities related to ca including uh, cold supply chain and much more and he also shares uh, industry 4.0 and uh, network building extensively actively engaged in startup ecosystem in industry and also engaged closely with chennai angels and much more an alumni of a college of engineering in gindi and iima and singularity university of california warm welcome to you, ravi thank you for really agreeing request to share the session this evening right. let me have the proud privilege of introducing mr k sinivasan again sinivasan doesn't need introduction to our members of ma you have heard him and uh, at least i'll walk miles to listen to him because his clarity of thoughts and delivery is so impressive and he is now presently is the managing director of <coughs> Kirloskar Pneumatic Company Limited. Currently, uh, earlier he was the managing director of Cumi, and where we got a very close association with a two thousand eight hundred crore company of Murugappa Group. And uh, Vishal Kar is nineteen eighty. Uh, he has been uh, managing director since two thousand five at Cumi, and he was ranked as most valuable CEO of a mid-sized company in the year two thousand twelve. 
and was on the board of a number of companies and currently also the independent director of the board of uh, Aspin Wall and Company Limited. And Srinivas is a mechanical engineer from <coughs> Suratkal and has uh, attended a number of management programs from all over the world. His hobbies include reading, co cooking, and gymming. Uh, Srinivasan, it's a, really a pleasure and privilege to have you with us again. It's always a pleasure to listen to you. Now, I'll hand it over to Mr. Ravichandran Purushwathaman, President of Madras Management Association, and also President Dan Force to introduce the topic and take it over. Mr. Ravi. Uh, thank you, Group Captain. Uh, am I audible? Thank you, sir. Very clear. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's indeed uh, my privilege to deliver the introductory address of this uh, special event, uh, Oxygen Challenge uh, and the Way Forward. Uh, organized by MMA in partnership with uh, Conrad Ordner Stiftung. Uh, I also consider it as an honor for me to welcome Mr. K. Srinivasan, Managing Director, uh, Kirlosko Pneumatic Company, uh, who's kindly accepted to give this uh, talk on this special theme and share his perspectives. Uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to welcome, welcome all the invitees, uh, guests. I know we are transmitting this uh, session across multiple platforms and also I welcome all the past presidents of MMA, uh, members of MMA across Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry. It gives me immense pleasure to also at this time thank all the membership who have supported us in these difficult times uh, and I think MMA has actually pivoted quite brilliantly over the last 14 months and uh, become a digitally enabled organization bringing to you live uh, both nationally and internationally uh, events uh, right through the periods where we have been under lockdown as well as when we have been out of lockdown. So I really would like to compliment uh, Mr. Uh, Group Captain Vijay Kumar for his uh, passion and his entire secretariat to, to really pull off these kind of events, which is not easy. Coming to uh, today's talk, uh, I think it's a very important uh, uh, topic, oxygen. Um, and I think uh, a lot more uh, we have learned about oxygen in the last probably four to five weeks. Um, I mean, it's such an interesting and a fascinating subject. Uh, you know, even despite me being a science student, uh, I never got the knowledge of uh, what an A oxygen cylinder is and what a D oxygen cylinder is. I learned a lot in the last uh, four to six weeks solving some of uh, the oxygen challenges for the state of Tamil Nadu being in the task force. But clearly, I think uh, this topic has generated uh, enormous amount of interest. Uh, and therefore, I think uh, it's truly apt that uh, we have this uh, topic for this evening. When you look at the uh, strategic challenge India currently has, uh, we have seen a meteoric rise uh, of about almost 140, 50% increase in the oxygen production in the country. Um, and, and remember medical oxygen and industrial oxygen are very different, uh, but even though they are different, I think uh, government has permitted use of industrial oxygen during the time of crisis. Uh, um, of course, there is, a, uh, there is a physics about oxygen. Uh, there is a chemistry about oxygen. Uh, when it comes to uh, how do you produce, how do you transport, uh, how do you actually put it to use. Uh, it's also an important raw material in, uh, in many of the key industries like steel, um, you know, making products out of uh, steel. So it's, it's a very, very fascinating topic. Uh, and I think when you look at the current challenge we, we face uh, as we come out of oxygen, uh, while we have stopped a lot of industry that has been requiring oxygen, uh, for production and diverted it to, to medical requirement. Uh, we also have no clue how the future should be built um, in terms of demand, both for medical requirements and uh, for uh, non-medical requirements. Potentially, there are many opportunities as a nation to really pivot. Um, just to give you an example, in, in many advanced countries, uh, today we are producing green hydrogen where oxygen is a byproduct. So we are at a very important juncture as a nation on how we basically manage uh, the, the supply chain needs of oxygen, the medical needs of oxygen. And I think uh, during uh, this last four or five weeks, we have also learned how important it is for us to look at uh, this topic. I think given this scenario, um, you know, um, 
I would like to probably uh, ask Mr. Srinivasan uh, to kind of give us his perspective as he's been truly involved and as one of the thought leaders in this area. How did we land ourselves in this situation? Uh, could it have been anticipated much better? Um, what are our logistical challenges that has uh, put us in this state, uh, both in terms of production and in terms of uh, distribution and transportation? Given that the pandemic is far from over, what is our way forward in managing oxygen supply, both for industrial use as well as for medical purposes? Like all others who are on this evening, on this platform and in many of the other platforms, I'm also very eager to know from Mr. Srinivasan about the current challenges in the oxygen availability and the various ways that we can actually convert this real challenge into a potential winning opportunity for both industry as well as for medical needs. Uh, once again, I would like to thank uh, CAS, who have been our partners for many, many years, uh, supporting MMA over the years, uh, and also take this opportunity to uh, thank all the members who are joining on this call and viewers globally. Wish you all a very exciting evening. And uh, I would hand it back to Mr. Uh, Group Captain. Yeah. So yeah. can I go? Okay. Yes. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Thank Let's you. Share the screen. Um, so let me start by saying, uh, President Ravi Pushotaman, uh, Group Captain Vijay Kumar, MMA, and ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for giving me this opportunity to talk to you about oxygen. Um, before I start, I must just acknowledge the tremendous work Captain Vijay Kumar and team at MMA have been doing all these years. I, it's worth repeating every time I get a chance to talk, saying that. They have been one of the finest management association across India for so many years, and it's not an accident. Uh, I think I always keep saying, give them a big hand. They've been putting together fabulous things every time. And not only have they been doing it successfully, but they have been able to transcend barriers and keep innovating. I mean, to get together and do it all now virtually is another amazing achievement. Congratulations to the entire team and to the leader out there who's sitting happily in Kodekanal and enjoying his time. But anyway, congratulations, sir. Well done. And now let's go ahead and look at the oxygen story. Is it visible to everybody? Yes, sir. It's visible, sir. Go ahead. Okay, good. So, uh, so first of all, once again, uh, good evening to all. I'm going to talk about the oxygen challenge and what we can look at as a way forward. A couple of things I would like to say in the beginning, two caveats and one disclosure. The two caveats are, one, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a virologist, I'm not an epitomologist, so I would not dwell too much about the COVID and what oxygen means to handle COVID patients. So that's the first caveat. The second one I would like to leave is that I'm going to use approximations in terms of calculation. People tell you it's exactly for 9,300 tons of oxygen. Maybe I will leave it at about 7,500 tons. So I'm going to use certain approximations in my presentation, but the essence is to get the message across. So those are the two caveats. One disclosure is that I manage Kiloska Pneumatic, and these, and this company is probably one of the largest producer of compressor that goes into making oxygen. So there is that disclosure that is up front in for, for all of you to know. Um, now coming quickly to the oxygen story, oxygen is the most third most prevalent element in the universe and the most prevalent element in the world. Now with this we still say that we don't have oxygen. So that's a challenge. So as you say from Coolridge, water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink. That's the story of oxygen. 21% of our biosphere is oxygen, but still we need it in the form and place by which we can consume it for what we require, particularly in terms of medical reasons. Okay. So the common use of oxygen, I think Mr. Pushottaman did mention, it's used extensively in manufacturing, right? From cutting steel to making steel, to making a lot of non-ferrous material, plastics, a whole lot of things needs oxygen. In normal times, almost 85% of the oxygen that is produced is used in engineering and manufacturing. Only about 10 to 15% is used for medical purpose. So that's a big challenge. 
The other challenge that we have to understand is oxygen in many cases is a byproduct. Uh, the bigger thing that people look for is actually nitrogen. So 89% of the atmosphere is nitrogen. And so most times we are actually looking for nitrogen and oxygen is actually expelled. Some of you living near uh, air separation plants, without mentioning names, if you have factories around that area, you will see that your factory has more corrosion than anything else because they actually are taking out the nitrogen and in a way enriching the oxygen around the place. Consequently, you see a little more corrosion in places which are near these kind of air separation plants. Now let's go to some numbers, which is interesting. Uh, I took it out. You can all go to this uh, website that's available. If you go to COVID-19 oxygen needs tracker, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a smart uh, site, so you can actually go and see it every day. It's current, it's Tableau-driven uh, product. So you can actually see it every day. If you look at the LIMIC countries, which is the low and middle income countries, uh, they alone would require something like 23 million cubic meters of oxygen per day. That's a huge quantity. We are talking in terms of roughly about between 15 to 20 lakh cylinders of oxygen is what India, India is about half of this, India would require per day. That was at the peak when we were consuming oxygen uh, during the COVID. This is about 23rd of May. So we were requiring something like about 15 to 20 lakh cylinders of oxygen a day. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the cost of all this, simply because this is a management school. This is a management association. We need to understand costs of everything that we do and what is the business case around it. Uh, there is an altruistic uh, part of it saying that we need to get oxygen for people who are suffering but we also have to understand what is going to be sustainable over a period of time. So really, if you look at it, it's, this is what is going to cost. About 20,000 crores a year is what it will cost India alone if you have to get this level of oxygen out every day to everybody out there. So that's a lot of money. Now, the global oxygen market is about $5 billion, and it's now galloping. It's going towards $30 billion. It's expected to move about to $30 million in the next year and so. So that's broadly the canvas we're looking at. It's a huge emerging opportunity in terms of business. It is a crying need in terms of social requirement. So that's what we said. At the peak, India was requiring about 20 lakh cylinders a day. Now we talk of cylinders, we talk of tons, we talk of so many things. So I will simplify the whole thing into some conversion numbers, which is easy for all of us to understand. Because what we actually give a patient is liters liters of oxygen and that is at a particular pressure generally it's about 0.5 bar or even less so let's go to that number here so what you get is a normal black cylinder what uh, Ravi Pushotam and did mention is in Indian standards you get a 1.5 meter tall cylinder which is black with a white top lid uh, top uh, coloring that is oxygen if it is blue it is nitrogen if it's yellow it is organ so generally these are the three cylinders you get Today, don't get too confused. They have been very freely being exchanged for each other with just a marking as O on top, simply because we don't have enough oxygen cylinders today to manage the situation. So generally, one cylinder has about seven cubic meters of oxygen at a 150 bar pressure. So that is what you get when you buy a cylinder. This cylinder has approximately 9.2 kilos of oxygen. So that's what you get. And approximately this translates to about 7,000 liters of oxygen. So when you actually feed a patient, generally they say normal times three to four liters a minute is good. But for most patients today during COVID times, they've been giving anywhere between seven to 10 liters a minute. So we're talking of a patient requiring anywhere between one to two cylinders a day if he's at peak requirement. So he requires one to two cylinders a day and that's the kind of thing we are talking of as requirement. Now let's go further. We were talking of India having the capacity. We always kept saying we have enough oxygen capacity. I think that's not true. Uh, to say that we have 7,500 tons of cryogenic oxygen per day translates to very roughly about 8.2 lakh cylinders, assuming we have no shortage of cylinders, assuming that everything can be bottled as cylinders, we would produce about 8.2 lakh cylinders. And 8.2 lakh cylinders, if you divide by two, approximately you'll be able to manage about four lakh beds, uh, which is really not much if you really look at it. And this is assuming nothing is wasted, everything is perfectly bottled, everything is perfectly made available at the respective location. These are all 
technical impossibilities, not just a question of logistics. It's impossible to do all this because oxygen gets produced in different places near factories. And the primary reason for most of these plants is not really to produce oxygen. So there are so many other challenges when you look at this. What are the real challenges? Uh, what is on record is India has 2.7 lakh oxygenated beds, beds which has oxygen supply. They have approximately 4,500 ICU beds. These are the official ones. Then we have created a whole lot of COVID camps, COVID beds, where they simply have a cylinder connected to a pipe, put a canola on it and put a regulator and connect it. Like you see this person here sitting there. Uh, he still has a cylinder. He's got a, just a water to bubble through a small regulator and he's got a canola and he just breathes oxygen. So these kind of ad hoc things are hundreds and thousands that have been done during the peak to accommodate the four lakh plus pass, uh, patients that we needed to give oxygen to. So there was a challenge that we really did not have oxygen. So in spite of saying that we'll convert, we'll ban all industrial requirement, convert everything for medical use. We just did not have enough oxygen. We did not have enough cylinders. We had to bring in cryogenic tankers. That means that cryogenic oxygen is moved in tankers, brought to different places, and then you bottle it so that you fill it into bottles so the bottles can be switched very quickly. Even today, as we speak, an empty container or a bottle, as we call it, is more difficult to get today, even if oxygen is available, because most of these COVID care centers have actually kept the oxygen cylinders and not returning it. So that's a challenge that we have, that we do not have enough cylinders to rotate now. So let's go back to the basics. Where does all this come from? So if you look at it, we have really three gases in air. 21% is oxygen. I've given very rough numbers. Like I said in the beginning, I'm not going to talk of 20.86 or whatever it is. 78% is nitrogen, 1% is argon. Now, out of the three, the, the only way we can separate these and get them out is by broadly three processes. And I'll touch the three processes by which we can separate these out and then make them useful. When we breathe normally, a normal human being breathes approximately about 2,000 liters a day. And it actually comes in a form which is most comfortable. You get oxygen and you get nitrogen. Oxygen actually burns. So nitrogen sort of is a lazy gas. It slows you down a little bit and allows you to consume the oxygen well. Pure oxygen by itself is harmful. So I'll touch that as well a little bit. So you need to get it in a mix. Okay, three broad ways by which you can make oxygen. There is one is called the cryogenic separation. There is a membrane separation and then the pressure swing absorption, the PSA method. So these are the three ways and uh, we have been using our, uh, we are very familiar with these two because we have a fairly dominant position in these two parts of it, which is really the cryogenic distillation as well as the pressure sharing absorption business. Now, uh, to give you an uh, some kind of a comparison, having a cryogenic distillation plant or a separation plant is like having a large power station. Having a, a PSA is like having a generator. Having a membrane is like having this little small uh, two-stroke engines, Honda uh, kits that you used to have in the earlier days at home to make power. So that's a kind of scale difference that we're talking of. In addition, I think uh, Mr. Ravi Pushomal did allude to it, that if you go in for electrolysis for making oxygen, uh, hydrogen, you will get oxygen as a byproduct uh, from water. Like I said, 89% by weight of water is oxygen. So consequently, if you're going to electrolyze and get out hydrogen, you will produce oxygen as a byproduct. But all this has its own challenges. Like this is possible if you're going to live in space where you say, look, you have to have a bio recycle system where the urine itself is and the, what you take for taking bath is again cracked. You take the hydrogen out and hydrogen, you actually have no need for it. You actually expel it. The oxygen is actually blended with nitrogen, which they carry, because you need to consume oxygen along with nitrogen on a longer term basis to have a, a sort of a, a comfortable living. So it's blended with nitrogen and then used for the people. So this is a process, but I'm excluding this in our discussion because this is completely difficult and very, very uh, far off as far as bulk production and use is concerned in, in the current situation. There's another misnomer that we all keep having, and that's the reason I put it here. Uh, we talk of oxygen tanks. When you talk of somebody going for a scuba diving, when somebody is going for a mountaineering, you say he carries an oxygen tank, and you see them as aluminum canisters. They actually are not oxygen tanks. They're only air tanks. They actually have only about 21% oxygen in it. Most of what you call as oxygen tanks are only air tanks. They just have air in it. Uh, 
pure oxygen is used very rarely in medical purpose hyperbaric requirements are very minimal where you have 100% oxygen being used and that is used for very specific purpose for short durations if you have somebody you want to kill somebody give him pure oxygen long enough and he's dead so oxygen actually burns so you have to be careful that when we talk a lot of time saying he needs oxygen most medical oxygen that we take is actually not 100% oxygen it can vary from anywhere between 60 to 80% or so short durations 100% or near 100% so we when you talk of somebody needs oxygen whether it's through a ventilator or through a cannula it is generally anywhere between 60 90% oxygen okay now we come to the known ways by which we can make oxygen for our current requirements or the near foreseeable requirements what you're all familiar with the cylinders i talked of this comes from the cryogenic tanks we have cryogenic tanks which actually separate air what we do is we take air we compress it and that's where we have a role we compress it by two methods there is a centri centrifugal compressors for large volumes reciprocating compressors for high intensity shorter smaller volumes compress it then you take it through an expander when you compress something and expand it very rapidly it dramatically cools so when you cool this separate air at minus 183 oxygen first condenses into a light blue liquid very near that minus 186 the nitrogen compressor uh, gets con condensed into a liquid and at 196 minus 196 you get nitrogen as a liquid so we actually liquefy them you compress them expand them through an expander and then it separates and you liquefy them one of the challenges of handling oxygen is oxygen is easier like you have lpg these are much easier to handle as a liquid to fill things rather than to fill them as gas i'll come to the technology part of it later so the most plants what we do is we use a separation plant air separation plant where you compress you expand each of them condense at different temperatures then you separate them out oxygen is a bit of a aggressive gas nitrogen and argon are lazy gases they don't go through as fast so they separate very easily and then when you cool them you get oxygen first minus 183 you take it out then you use it through cryogenic pumps to fill bottles this is how the whole thing works then you have this which is what is very familiar now in all our panic most people have gone out and bought these uh, what we call as membrane driven uh, oxygen concentrators this is also a form of psa but these are small ones run with dry very light pumps single phase machines um, half a kilowatt uh, these are let's say they will work but that's about very broadly very ad broadly i would say that these are for short periods of time before you get to something more serious um, so they can get you uh, oxygen same method uh, they have i'll come to that when i touch this as, as well then you have the psa plants which are more scalable which is what eventually will be there all over the country i would assume here you have two psa tanks which are mem which are got a uh, filtration by molecular sieves these molecular sieves are generally zeolite the earlier versions had sodium zeolite now you'll all have lithium zeolite and then when you send the compressed gas through this system uh, the nitrogen being a lazy gas doesn't go through easily oxygen rushes through the nitrogen is filtered out that's why you call it pressure swing adsorption it is adsorption not absorption so it's nitrogen is filtered out oxygen goes through you then compress it and then you deliver it that's how this is used let's quickly jump what are the advantages of each of them and look at the concentration scalable large ones of the cryogenic business this generally a cryogenic plant would take anywhere between a year to two year to set up if somebody says that they have increased the oxygen production by 100% in one one month two months uh, take it with uh, more than a teaspoon of salt a cryogenic plant would take anywhere between 1 year to 2 year to set up so i don't think they commissioned any new cryogenic plant in the last 1 year uh, la i wouldn't say 1 year last 2 months we have been delivering uh, compressors for almost 85% of them we are shipping out at the rate of almost 10 a month uh, but it takes time to get these up they are pretty large plants and they take time to get them up what has been happening is there has been a switch between working for getting nitrogen and expelling oxygen to bottling oxygen and letting go of the nitrogen so that is where all the nitrogen containers are getting switched oxygen is being collected and dispatched 
This is what is currently being done in large quantities. You fill them in uh, cryogenic tanks, you fill them into, pump them into these cylinders, and you then move them around. This is what is being done all over now. And it's being imported, it's being shipped around, and this is a, this is on normal times the cheapest way because you you're really doing it for nitrogen. Oxygen is a byproduct. You can fill them in tanks and ship them around. But in the crisis situation, this is the only thing that is available out of the 7,500 tons that we had. I think almost all of it were forced to be converted and sent out for medical purpose. A significant part of it was done, not all of it. And that's how we were able to get through the crisis. What is being now built in large numbers are going to be the pressure swing adsorption machines. Eventually, my submission would be that every hospital would have and should have a pressure swing adsorption machine, which will locally produce oxygen from electricity. You just pump in a, a plug in a compressor, it will then take the air from the atmosphere, put it through the two zeolite tanks, get you oxygen, which you can just pipe it in and deliver it to the patients. So they may still have a basic cryogenic tanks or basic cylinders because at long term, this could be cheap when it is working and available. But on a crisis basis, every hospital would be mandated eventually to have a pressure showing adsorption system. The membrane or the smaller concentrators would continue to be available for individuals. Uh, people who can afford it, like they have an air conditioner at home, would all eventually buy one of this to sort of give them some comfort. But this is only going to be a temporary solution and for a short period of time. But India used to get about 40,000 of it in a year. Today, we are probably getting about 40,000 of it a month. Most of it comes from China and Europe. And this is, will continue to come in. It's pretty uh, cheap. It doesn't have too much of a manufacturing base in India. But eventually, they will make this in India as well. So let me simplify this whole thing into a graph. It says where and what will be used. Large volumes, long term, the lowest cost basis would be all the cryogenic tanks. But they would always have challenges of logistics, challenges of, um, let's say, getting it to the right place on a continuous basis. And it cannot take ups and downs. So this is something like a large thermal plant. This would provide you low cost based load requirement. The big thing that has to develop and come in quickly, not only in India, but across the world, is the PSA system. The pressure swing adsorption and or it could be vacuum swing adsorption systems are like having a local generator. It would be a top up power or a power that it comes in when the cryogenics are not available or cannot be available on a continuous basis. This would become a mandated requirement for hall hospitals, even large housing societies, etc. Just like you have today in uh, in in uh, commercial complexes, etc. This would have to be something that we will have to get used to. The membrane-based smaller ones would be something that you have at home. Uh, you would use it short periods of time or just for the convenience till such time as you get something to uh, something stronger to plug into. So the advantages of the pre-SA system, which we don't have in any significant numbers today in India, are localized generation, needs only power, no transportation, no pressurized cylinders, no cryogenic storage. It's the easiest, safest, cleanest way to do things. We already have this in India, and a lot of them you would have read saying that a lot of nitrogen PSAs have been converted to oxygen. This is true. Uh, we ourselves have been delivering for defense a lot of the nitrogen PSA systems because nitrogen is required for blanketing fuel tanks, for blanketing the control panels, for the uh, remote places, filling up tires, for filling up all the gravity suits, etc. So there have been PSAs already in use in the defense services. They've just switched around. Instead of collecting the nitrogen, you expel the nitrogen and collect the oxygen. So that's what they've been doing. It all works on a short term basis. Like I said, you'll have to change the whole thing and get larger scale done. But the theme of the whole thing I would submit is that we as a country would have to get comfortable with the fact that we cannot have just a cryogenic system being distributed. We'll have to get comfortable that we all hospitals will have to have a PSA system working. Quick look at what the domestic, I would call, concentrators look like. And this would be very similar. It's a single phase system. It's got a little uh, compressor with actually rubber pistons. This is not a long, long duration, rugged system. It's for one patient to have for short periods of time. That's all it is. A small compressor has a small cooling system, 
then goes through solenoid valves into the two zeolite sieves, they are membrane sieves, and then one separates out the nitrogen, which gets expelled out, and the other one takes the oxygen, and then it goes through there. You take it to a canola and you breathe through it. There's a tank, and then you breathe. A couple of uh, important things to know about is if you're running this in an air conditioned room, maybe big ones, even if you go and run a PSA, you must be mindful of the fact that you're enriching the room with nitrogen. You're breathing in the oxygen and you're making the room more nitrogen in, uh, intense, which also affects the others. I used to tell uh, people when they bought these large uh, PSA systems that we give, they put it inside a hospital air conditioned room. I said nitrogen would stay, though it's marginally uh, lighter than air. It's about the same, both are one. Uh, but it's a lazy gas. It doesn't move very quickly. And with the fan blowing down or with air conditioning, you, I used to say that, look, if you guys leave everything inside, your patients will have the oxygen, your nurses and doctors will have nitrogen, and you see them all going away peacefully by next day morning. So be mindful of what we're doing when we take these new things. So this is how the big systems work. You have the molecular sieves. Generally, what is now being used is the zeolite sieves, which are with lithium ions, not the sodium ions anymore. Future, I believe, would also go towards activated carbon, which is now used largely for getting the biomaterial out. But you would go into, let's say, to graphene and other things, which can also be good molecular sieves. So what we really do is have the compressor. Uh, this is a dryer. When you talk of any silica gel, it's a dryer. It removes all the traces, uh, uh, sodium silicate, everything would remove all the uh, moisture, oil, etc. Then you take it through the adsorption co column. Why do you call it pressure swing? It goes through one column first, nitrogen gets filtered out, oxygen goes through. As the sieve gets filled out with more and more nitrogen, it will swing to sending through this, and this will now pump back and expel the nitrogen out. So the nitrogen has to be exhausted out. Nitrogen and a little bit of 1% of organ has to be exhausted out. The same thing, you swing between this and this, and then pure oxygen gets collected here, and that is what is then regulated and given to the patients. So that's what it is. So like I keep saying, nitrogen is into the space where it is. So if you put them outside in the air, the nitrogen just goes away. It gradually raises up and goes away. But if you keep it in an enclosed area, you're heading for trouble. So what have we done in the last uh, three, four months? We are on mission mode. Uh, we are being... Uh, uh, monitor, tracked, and uh, the government has put DRDO as an old agency to push these things. They've been freely pushing for these things to be done. All the moving parts are built by us. Uh, this is the compressor part. The, the zeolite tanks and the PSA parts are being locally built by several people. You just have a plug and play. You connect them up, and then you can get oxygen, and you can feed it into the various pa patients through the ma manifold. I've just given a comparison how they look. Today, what has happened in a lot of our uh, cities, they've quickly converted large halls into COVID centers. They just put the beds, they got these tanks, they connected them up and put a canola saying that we are giving you oxygen tanks and patients. These are not fully regulated. The guys manage it somehow. And these tanks are not returned. So consequently, they're not going back to getting the cryogenic fillings getting done. This is what is being done to manage the crisis. Um, this would probably, the oxygen from this would have been from an air separated, let's say, in a, in a factory in Jharkhand. Then it would have moved from cryogenic tankers by either train or whatever it is. Then it had been brought into somewhere in central India, Madhya Pradesh. Then they re it into these kind of tanks and then they put it to patients. The logistics is a nightmare and it is unsustainable. What we have to do in a PSA system is just connect it in wherever you have the power. You pick the air from the atmosphere take it through the pressure swing adsorption system and directly feed it through the manifold to the patients. You can regulate the oxygen content, you can regulate the oxygen air mixture, and you can feed it in at each location. This would be more sustainable. So I think going forward, this is what is likely to be a big thing. There is a push to get as many of these things working as possible. We don't have too many at the moment, but they're getting it up quickly. That's how the compressor look. I don't want to do any sales pitch out here. It's This is just to show you that all the moving parts are within this ready to pack. There's a, 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 a cooler. There is a filtration system. There is an air intake filter. There is a noise suppression canopy. And there is the air in, which is really the screw compressor, which does everything. So this is a very simple system. 
and it doesn't cost much. So I will also show you that, okay, it's got a whole lot of system that it's got a dryer, it's got all the accessories, everything is plug and play. Just to give you an idea, for a 60 bed hospital delivering, let's say 10 liters per minute, it would not cost you more than 10 lakhs. So this is not going to be very big. So this is something which is very affordable kind of a thing. So I don't get into the sales pitch. Now let me come to the, the bigger part, the cryogenic oxygen. Now these are two types, like I said, there are what is called as the air separation plants, where the primary objective of these plants is to take air and take out various things, nitrogen, argon, oxygen. So their only objective is to make this. These plants generally tend to use reciprocating compressor, you take air, pressurize it to about 42 bar or higher, and then take it through these expanders after all these cleaning, filtration, everything, take it through the expander, you rapidly expand it. Oxygen, like I said, will cool into a liquid at minus 182. And then you can take cryogenic pumps and pump them into these cylinders, or you can pump them into large cryogenic tankers and track them along to wherever you want to take it. You can do the same for nitrogen, you can do the same for argon. This is broadly how this is done for the air separation plants. We, we, have, we do a lot of this work. But these are what is used in process industries. Let's say you go to a, a, a non-ferrous industry, you go to a, a, a steel plant, they have these huge centrifugal compressors. They do the same, they take the air, they compress it, but these are far higher volumes. A part of it is used as gas itself by the process. Some part of it is again taken to the expander, condensed and stored so that they can use that liquefied gas for their process as gas. They're not actually trying to sell it as a liquefied oxygen or nitrogen. It goes back to be gasified and used in their own requirement. Now, what we have done is we have stopped all this industrial activity we still are producing a significant part of it as gas that is being expelled in the respective locations. Only a part of it can be converted into a cryogenic liquid and that alone is being transported. So this is how it is being done. And it is still being done because there is a ban on using it for industrial purpose. Some exemptions are there. We have gradually started seeing this happening, but that's how it is being done at the moment. Now, what is the problem today? Today, oxygen is seen as a medical supply in a crisis. So we are now taking a very altruistic way, uh, look at things, saying that forget the cost, forget it, what it takes. We'll have to keep people alive. Just move it wherever it is to wherever it is required and just give it to them. Um, quite honestly, it's unsustainable. It's costing billions of dollars. And if you run it for a long enough period, uh, it will be impossible. Going forward, this has to move into a more ethical, professional business activity. And that's the reason why I thought it must be talked about in a business school or in a management school, because everything is a supply demand issue. Oxygen is required for living. Oxygen has to be delivered to patients, but it cannot always live in an altruistic activity basis. It has to move to an ethical, professional business of making it for consumer, consumer and in the right place at the right price. So I go back to the future. What are the future likely to be? Uh, I would believe that the large cryogenic plants are like the large thermal power stations. They would exist. They have a purpose. They would, per unit, still have the lowest cost because you're going to use the nitrogen. You're going to use the oxygen. You will use the argon. This will be the, the efficient way of doing it. Part of it will be transported. It will be used by hospitals, by people, etc. But this cannot meet the surges. It cannot meet the peaks and valleys. It will have huge challenges. So going forward, just like we all have mandated the gensets must be kept in every place where you have a, a commercial activity or hospitals, where power requirement has to be continuous, mandated. Every commercial establishment will not be allowed to have a license without a genset. Same is going to happen with the PSA system. Hospitals must be mandated to have a PSA oxygen generator. They may have a cocktail of both this and the PSA generator in normal times because they would find sometimes it's cheaper to get this. But during peaks and during crisis, they would switch more and more towards using the PSA generators. We would continue to have these little concentrators at homes, just like you have the little Honda or the Yamaha gensets. They would be for people who use it for short periods of time or people who need to have uh, oxygen support even on a longer basis at home but they will not be really on a commercial or hospital requirement basis. So that's what the future is likely to be in oxygen. 
I don't think we are going to see our uh, life come back to a stage where we will go back to her living only out of these uh, large cryogenic plants. We would have to get to a mixture of all the three and we would have to do it all pretty quickly. And we'll have to be getting ready for the third, the fourth, or how many ever waves that are going to come because Japan is already talking about the fourth wave. We don't know how much is going to be the requirement. Uh, the government is doing everything on mission mode. We are working very closely with the uh, DRDO and I think they will put out something like about 500 at least of these PSA plants across the country. I believe they want to have one in every district. But I think going forward, it will be more than that. I think every hospital will be mandated to have it of different sizes. I mean, we, we can have it for 20 beds going up to 100 bed requirement. And that will become a mandated thing for the future. We'll have to look back to look ahead. If you look back, I gave an example of power, but you look at what else we ingest. Most of the food we consume have gone through some level of processing. The water we consume, most of what we take today have gone through some level of treatment or some level of processing. To expect that the air we consume long term basis will continue to be without any level of processing is I, I think that's not the way it's going to be. You will eventually come to a stage where most of the air that we consume, for, at least for critical requirements, would have a level of processing. And so the way ahead will definitely be through a molecular sieve based pressure swing adsorption system, at least to start with, but that will also get improved over a period of time. One short uh, note I have to leave here is one of the most difficult gases to compress is oxygen. Oxygen is easier to be liquefied and pumped. To compress oxygen per se is exceptionally difficult. So when we talk of anything that we do, we don't actually compress oxygen, we compress air. Oxygen has to be compressed in a very different way. It is most difficult and it is also expensive. So that's the reason why generally, even if you have this very easy light oxygen available from our, from our electrolysis process, etc., to collect that oxygen and compress will be exceptionally expensive and difficult. So that's the reason why you would have to go through these routes. And that's a technical challenge. We don't have a solution for that at the moment. So that's broadly what I want to leave with all of you. I want to say, uh, to all of you, be safe, be positive. Uh, we keep saying in Pune for many weeks, like I said, uh, Pune was the COVID capital in terms as a city. Uh, we had a lot more COVID care cases in Pune than any other city till we lost that dubious distinction to Bangalore and then I don't know where else we lost it to. But we have come out of it largely. And in all that we keep saying three things, be doubly vaccinated, be doubly safe, but also work doubly hard. This is not going away in a hurry. So let's keep working hard. Thank you all for listening patiently. Good luck. Thank you, Mr. Srinivasan. That was uh, really a fascinating masterclass. Uh, quite a lot of uh, insights uh, you have shared. And uh, truly, I think you made uh, a very difficult topic. Uh, you know, in a, you put it in a very nice way, which is uh, a big, big thank you from my side. I think for, for a person like me who had basic engineering and science knowledge, you have actually demystified quite a lot of stuff around oxygen. Uh, so, Group Captain, uh, would you like to figure out? Uh, yes, uh, we have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Nivasan. It's uh, very fascinating. I think as you rightly choose MMA anyway, because most of us uh, are really not aware of what's happening behind the scene and it's really opened uh, very thought provoking insights. Uh, so, we know exactly where we are and how we are and how we are going to face the future. It's, yes, uh, we have a bright future. Subject to, as you said, uh, we take the right initiative. And I, I must say, this really interesting. Over 900 viewers are watching the program live on all, all our social media portals, uh, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and our own website, number MMA Radio. The number of questions have come. Maybe, uh, Ravi, you would like to take on some questions, uh, or shall I move it to right away to the uh, uh, you know, what are the questions which have come? And also, all the viewers uh, watching this program, uh, Zoom, if you have any questions, Please do put them in the chat box so that uh, the speaker will be more than happy, delighted to respond to your question. And uh, uh, Ravi, you got any question? Then I'll go yeah. to them. Uh, uh, I basically have uh, a question around uh, how should a, a nation like us, uh, should we create an oxygen bank? Uh, or what should be the approach that we should take? Uh, because it's about... Uh, what we have learned a hard lesson in the last four weeks clearly shows uh, while balancing lives, we have actually, uh, you know, made a big uh, compromise on livelihood. When I say that, what I mean by that is 
we had to stop steel plants, stop continuous process industries uh, because we had to protect lives. Uh, so in the future, I mean, in the medium term and in the long term, what do you think should be the recipe if India needs to come out of this crisis? Yeah, so I, I think, uh, like I said, um, oxygen is around, all around us. It's available. It's not in the form that we want uh, and, in the, uh, and in the kind of pressure and quality that we need. So we have to have distributed uh, oxygen generation plants. So the only technology that is viable at the moment is the PSA method, which is really pressure swing adsorption. It is not expensive. You can just have, wherever you have power, you just plug it in, you will get oxygen 80% comfortably, which is very comfortable for most industrial and medical application. Uh, it is going to be a little more expensive than the cryogenic oxygen provided we have the whole value chain mapped in. So what is going to happen is you'll have to have a mix of both. You must have PSA systems across the country, every hospital, every home in one form or the other, and that will protect lives. So that's the way it's going to be. I, I think uh, the government is mindful of this. And I think that's the only way because oxygen is everywhere. It's not the question of where we have to get it. Why do we produce it one place? So the bank is all around us. We have to have those little ATM machines which will dispense it in the form that we want. So that's going to be the PSA machines to start with. It will come later to other kinds of technologies where you have more of uh, uh, other kinds of molecular seeds which are even more efficient. But at the moment, the only proven scalable technology that is out there is a standard PSA machines, which you just plug it in and you get oxygen, which is good enough, which is better than most of these dangerous cryogenic tankers that you're getting now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have one more question, uh, Mr. Srinivasan. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the cost of production of oxygen uh, using a PSA technology uh, is relatively higher than uh, the cryogenic uh, option. Uh, I know when you mentioned that you can uh, plug in a system and uh, a PSA system and uh, use electricity to convert into oxygen. What we also hear, uh, the reason I'm asking this question is, you know, as, as, as many companies in Tamil Nadu, we have, uh, as part of uh, the current mode, we have also trying to build a PSA plants for government hospitals. And uh, when we talk to our suppliers who are setting up plans for us, for example, my company, we have ordered some plans for a government hospital. Uh, one of the things we hear is that one, it's energy wise, it's, it's an expensive option. Uh, second, they talk about the zeolite, the sleep, uh, some kind of material that requires to be imported, which is also in shortage. Uh, do you see uh, any other innovation that India can bring? Because how do we prevent this opportunity uh, to make a future generation uh, oxygen production uh, so that it also helps to grow the MSME sector. Yeah. So I, I think you so you hit the nail on the head. Today, there's a panic to buy PSA systems because that's the only way you get oxygen wherever you need. And consequently, zeolite price have gone up eight times in the last four months. So we are importing it. Uh, I think we have air freighted most of it from Germany, from BASF and others. So it's it's gone up some eight times in the last uh, six months. And uh, unfortunately or fortunately, it is lithium zeolite. Lithium has got uh, other more exciting applications like you're talking of in EVs and other things. So really the future, like I keep saying, is it's not going to be just zeolite or lithium zeolite. It will move towards other molecular sieves, um, which could have graphene and other carbon nanomaterial in it, which would also make it more efficient and then consequently it could bring down the power. But all said and done, energy cost for a PSA system is definitely going to be higher than uh, you have from a regular cryogenic plant. It's exactly the comparison between a thermal plant, whether it's coal fired or whatever it is, will give you power at uh, maybe what, three rupees a unit, while you want to have a diesel generator, you're talking of 11 rupees a unit. But they're not for the same application or the same purpose. You would have one as a base load, the other one as a top up. So the PSA is going to be only a top-up requirement. It is not going to be a standard regular one. That's my submission with the current level of technology. It will change as technology improves. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Group captain, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh, we've got a number of questions, social media, a couple of questions come in the chat box too. I'll go to social media first and because uh, they've been waiting for some time with these questions, sir. Here's a question from Ramurthy from Chennai on Facebook. What do you want to know, sir? 
despite the covid-19 crisis at home india doubled the oxygen export uh, in their financial year 2021 how do you see this is it true the statement is true sir uh i don't want to answer this question because it's it's very difficult to uh, uh, answer some of these questions um because it's it's so whatever they picked up would be probably from a, a database so what form it was sent why it was sent pretty difficult to answer this question so i think okay. like i said uh, most of the oxygen making is near let's say thermo uh, power plants it's near petrochemical complexes and wherever this has gone out oxygen was really a by product most of them were actually requiring nitrogen so some of it would have got exported but it is difficult now to on hindsight to say whether it is right and wrong because in any case we wouldn't have stored it so it's not that we have a oxygen shortage we are all oxygen is all around us we don't know how to use it and how to move it around that's a challenge we still have the challenge so uh so here's a question from mr ari kumar in the chat box he says uh, it looks like more than a an inquiry rather than the question how much time will it take to deliver 25 kilowatt compressor of 250 uh, lbm and 45 kilowatt of 500 lbm Uh, I, i again i don't want to give a wrong answer i think we are all completely booked out till something august september or whatever it is but i think i'll do my best if you send it i will see that you get it ahead of everybody else in the queue if it is for a critical requirement and something is important for you we'll do it question from uh, professor baskara sir what do you want to how to separate oxygen from nitrogen and how to ensure 100% cleanliness of oxygen that is supplied to the patients Uh, like i said you you don't need 100% oxygen for a patient you don't want to kill him uh, you definitely want him to have some nitrogen along with the oxygen except in hyperbaric uh, uh, requirements where they talk of very high purity of oxygen otherwise even in space they talk of uh, nitrogen oxygen combined as being delivered so you need to have nitrogen along with it so i'm not a doctor but i'm told that you you don't need 100% oxygen at all you may need it only for very rare cases of hyperbaric surgeries or hyperbaric requirements short periods of time uh, so we don't try and make it because you will in all kinds of methods whatever level of purity if you get to about 99% oxygen that's pretty good because you will realize that the the uh, argon and oxygen are also pretty near each other so one is uh, 183 minus the other is 1 86 minus so you will get traces of argon coming in so we have a challenge you will never be able to get to pure 100% there <clears throat> is a question from christopher from pondicherry he says why do you think uh, there is an impression uh, among the people i don't know is true or false why do you think some manufacturers hesitate to come forward to lend their plan to produce oxygen is it true is it true oh. first statement see uh, like i said anybody who's now uh, gone into altruistic mode of oxygen ha- offering oxygen the cost of the oxygen they are delivering is uh, exorbitant because that is the plants are not meant for producing oxygen so they were actually meant for producing nitrogen uh, oxygen was just being kept as a by product today if they have to discharge all the nitrogen and give you the oxygen uh, that is one challenge second is all the oxygen that they produce were not to be Uh, liquefied and bottled a lot of it would have actually been consumed if the plants were running as only oxygen gas now if they want to still liquefy it for the tankers or the cans they would still expel this oxygen gas without any consumption so you're paying for that as well so there is a lot of challenges which we don't talk about saying that look you're not consuming everything that you're producing but what you consume would have to pay for uh, everything that you eventually produced so it's a bit of a challenge so they they are not very keen to do this nobody is keen to do it only when they'll do it if it's forced to and a lot of industries have said okay we will lose money but we'll continue to do it a lot of our plants we voluntarily gave up all the cylinders because we said look we had all this we had to have gas cutting without oxygen cutting you can't run compress uh, fabrication but a lot of us gave up saying that look life is more important than money i think a lot of them have done it like i keep saying the altruistic drive is only going to last that long it has to move to ethical professional way of making oxygen and when you come there a lot of this will disappear you can't do it this way there's a question from jennifer from bangalore she wants is the national lockdown or maybe a localized lockdown does it help because it will reduce the number of cases meanwhile it will give an opportunity for uh, the oxygen manufacturer to really tie up their issues and easy uh, movement of uh, cylinders logistics do you think the lockdown indirectly helps uh, manufacturers to really you know come out uh, with a better options and better distribution systems 
So I'll, I'll go to my first caveat. I don't know anything about lockdown helping in a medical thing, but I'll tell you what did happen on oxygen. When they banned oxygen for all industrial usage, we did appeal through various forums to get oxygen released for the two large oxygen cylinder manufacturers. To manufacture oxygen cylinders itself, you need oxygen to cut and, bear and to do all the uh, welding. So we did get it released. It took time. We also have some special approvals to use oxygen. But like I said, when you stop something, you stop everything, uh, good, bad, everything. On a hindsight, it's difficult to say right or wrong, but that's how we worked. We saved some lives, but at a very, very high cost. We did a lot of other things. Yeah. A question from Mr. Mohan from Salem. Uh, what do you want to know, sir? Without a regulator, it is also extremely dangerous to use oxygen cylinders for patients. There are different kinds of cylinders which need a specific type of regulator. In some places, available oxygen cylinders couldn't be used because shortage of regulator. Can this problem be solved by making delivery system of oxygen cylinders uniform, which can fit any type of regulator so that it becomes easier for the users to fit and place? So in the last uh, three, two, two and a half months, uh, a significant number, see oxygen cylinders of a total number of cylinders available in this country were only about 15%. Most of it is are actually nitrogen and argon cylinders. Today in the panic and what we had as a requirement, all of them have been converted for use for oxygen. Uh, there was no other way we could get this many number of cylinders. So that's why I said, you look at the painting at the top, black with a white cover was oxygen. Today, black with blue, black with yellow, everything is available. They just mark it O because they had to convert and use. So this is a chaos. So you can't do this always. But we couldn't do anything else in such a short notice. So we have done what we had to do. There have been collateral damages. There have been all kinds of challenges. Uh, but India is India. We had to do what we had to do. Sure. Uh, here's a question from Mr. Sate from Nagpur. He says, uh, it's again, you may like to answer or you can leave it. It's something related to both uh, uh, your medical thing. Also. According to some doctors, the use of industrial oxygen can be one reason for the uh, black fungus as there is a different in the production industrial And do you think this could be one of the reasons for increase in number of fungus affected? I think, I don't think you are really merit in your caveat. You will not be able to answer. Caveat one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. so sorry, Mr. Sate. I, I think you have to check. But uh, just to say that uh, every the number of possibilities people have put out, the way we have to panic and get oxygen, we didn't get the best of oxygen. We had to somehow save lives. So we have used what was available. So there will always be some cost. So we got another five minutes. Uh, we'll try and accommodate a few more questions which has come. And uh, then actually, they're also wondering what is the supply chain issue uh, of logistical challenge and how the government, the corporate, uh, and the other people have come together to solve this issue. This is a question which has come from Mr. Yeah. Mohan from Chennai. So, uh, like I explained, the supply chain, this oxygen by cryogenic route is not meant for this scale of distribution. You have a plant, let's say, sitting somewhere in Jharkhand, which is actually producing steel. It has some quantity of liquid oxygen, which it stores for its own requirement because they don't want to run the compressor continuously and the expander continuously. Now, they have not only shipped that out, they also have shipped a lot of other things which they would require in their own steel making. Now, it is not expected that they'll have cryogenic tankers, so they had to import tankers. They didn't have so many cylinders, so they had to do it. So all this is make do with what we had. It is not designed for this kind of activity. Eventually, if you have to have distributed oxygen manufacture, even air plants, as we say, with compressors, would have to be set up in different parts of this country with different levels of, again, bottling and distribution. It can't be carried such a long distance. Uh, from the time of bottling, they say they don't want to carry more than 200 kilometers or so. The rest of them, they're carried by cryogenic tankers. So we may not need to do all this if you have a distributed level of manufacture. At the moment, we couldn't set up new plants. Like I said, it takes between one to two years. So we just panicked and brought whatever we could get from wherever. We imported it. Like I said, we brought by plane. We brought by ships. We bought by train. We brought it from wherever we could with whatever cylinders we could get. Because everybody wanted it, including the, the including the courts. They said, why the hell can't you get oxygen? Just get oxygen. So what else do you do? It's not so simple, right? <laughs> so we did all that we could. From Sundaram, I think is I think looks like an investor uh, from Facebook. He says, since the auction crisis, the listed auxygen manufacturers' shares such as Bakoti auction has gone up by more than 100%. Do 
do you think option companies will have a bright future in future on a lighter vein i can tell you some of these oxygen named uh, company shares that went up actually have nothing to do with oxygen they don't even produce oxygen <laughs> i don't know about this company but uh, there have been several instances of somebody say such as oxygen company which has actually no oxygen production their shares also went up so on a lighter vein i think uh, uh, smarter investors know what to buy and what not to the question from uh, mr venkatesh and sheshatri on the chat box he says is uh, you did you, you did mention your presentation Uh, is a centralized auction plant is hospital better than individual cylinders in each bed you did mention absolutely, maybe absolutely absolutely i think we will get there this putting individual cylinders as no control who's going to tweak the regulator what is actually the poor patient getting it's all left to chance i think it is not practical to do this long term they've done it because they had these huge covid uh, uh, uh camps where they had thousands of bed to be set up they couldn't do the piping they just put cylinders there and connected them up so i i think we must not look behind how we crossed this last 3 months we should be sure that we don't get back to doing the same thing going forward it should be much more smarter so step one like i said more distributed oxygen generation using either expanders air plants which will still have cylinders which will still come from cryogenic route step 2 is to mandate every hospital that they must have a psa generator internally and that two things will ensure that we don't hit this crisis again this question again from uh, ram kumar he says uh, uh, you are advised to the medical fraternity because you are receiving and being put so much of pressure on you to produce oxygen to meet the thing what would be your advice what you learn to the medical fraternity to state government to the hospitals uh, You did mention each one of them should set up their own plan so that they don't get in trouble. Maybe you would like to add anything more to that? What you have mentioned already? Exactly the same, sir. Nobody expected. See, I don't blame anybody in this case. I think even the first wave didn't come up with this level of oxygen expectation. There was a shortage of ventilators. This time was an unusual thing, and I think this is happening everywhere. We have inquiries from all over the Limic countries. It is. all over the place it's prevailing in iran from south africa everywhere so this we see there's a trend that it this should be done now at least we have learned our lesson we have come out of it relatively unscathed compared to the enormity of the problem that was in front of us i think we reacted pretty well our ability to uh, hustle up things has been pretty good we draw up all our blank checks and ensure that we picked up all the uh, cryogenic uh, tankers from various parts of the world we brought them in i think we hustled around and did well we did lose life but i think we hustled around and did a pretty good job considering the enormity of the problem going forward we should never get into this position again we must get more distributed oxygen making capacity across the country it's going to take time the shortest time i think mr ravi pushottam will mention even if you order today a psa nobody is going to give you anything before august september so at least let's get prepared for the october wave if it is to come you have a question from mr jit from jabal post he says the railway seems to have played a major role in transporting oxygen across the country do you think anything else could have been done to enhance the supply chain future and how much uh, i think you have really mentioned it. not self you know cost effective to try you know lift it yeah. from even indian air force chip then uh, to share lift them uh, yeah indian navy brought in uh, indian navy brought in tankers air force has been continuously bringing in not so much as the oxygen they didn't want to come empty they actually needed the cryogenic uh, uh, tankers that they had to bring railways did it but this is all stop cap temporary they did a good job but that's not the future so in your perspective yeah, being closely working with uh, the government and what is the time frame you think uh, this crisis will be resolved to some extent and do you think the oxygen crisis is a result of poor uh, management or poor foresight to really you know expect something which could go wrong uh, uh, what, what do you think and how, how we could have prepared it had we planned it uh, uh, quite well in advance um i i would rather look ahead rather than look behind i think we have come out of the peak of the second wave reasonably well uh we lost lives we have had a huge amount of uh, uh crisis in terms of handling whatever happened but going forward if you are on mission mode get enough psa tanks get enough distributed oxygen separation plants across the country get enough bottling capacity we would be much better prepared for the third fourth and whatever number of waves that come ahead of us i think we have learned our lesson logistics is not the issue 
distributed manufacturing is what we'll have to look at. I'll give you again the same example. Look at your water requirement. You don't carry water from Ganga and bring it to Tamil Nadu for Chennai. You have to have distributed water uh, ma management, whichever way it is. So that's the way it's going to be. Distributed man ma management of air requirement, uh, oxygen requirement. One last question, sir. I think we almost come to the thing and we have been kind enough to respond to most of the questions. Uh, he says one should learn from mistakes, actually. What, in your opinion, is India's most important learning from this crisis? And how do you think, uh, put something which should be a guideline for the future? I would say one characteristic that uh, defines all of us is our willingness to quickly forget the past. Uh, as soon as we, today we have in Maharashtra roughly about 22,000 cases positive every day, we lose about 300 lives. This doesn't worry us as much as it was worrying us when we had 65,000 cases and about 600 deaths. So quickly we think we, have, uh, we are over the top, we don't have to worry anymore. I think we quickly forget that this is still very, very high. So our willingness to start preparing for the next crisis, willingness to invest and say, look, we are not won anything. It's only a respite that we're getting for a short time. Giving us time to prepare for the next one is important. I think the biggest mistake we think is we are always, the worst is behind us. Now it's all hunky-dory. We don't have to think about it again. And that's a, that's a problem. As Indians, we get into it very quickly. We have to use these little respites to prepare for the next big battle. And I think that's a caution that I would leave because if you look at Japan, they're talking about the fourth wave. Japan is going through oxygen shortage. So we are a, a very, very large developing limit country. Uh, we have to continuously be on guard saying this is not a battle that we have won. This is one little respite that we have got in a large battle that's still ahead of us. I think one passing uh, information what Mr. Ari Kumar Kopal has put in the chat box. He says uh, they are working with the DRDO for supplying 250 LPM and 500 LPM PSA medical oxygen plant, uh, 50 units each uh, every you know, uh, short delivery time. But he finds compressor delivery will be the challenging to their delivery expectation schedule. <laughs> Maybe just we we'll do our best. Chat. We are doing our best. We are on mission mode. I have not gone out of the factory for the last six months. Uh, we have all of us, like I said, doubly vaccinated, doubly safe, but working doubly hard. We have had uh, fatalities. We have had a serious number of cases here. But with all this, we are committed this is like on a war footing really guys are working hard to see that we deliver with all challenges there's no oxygen there's no we have to get uh, new methods of uh, working on steel we all learned new things in all this crisis but in all that let me assure you uh, i think as a nation and this is not us there are all several other compressor manufacturers all of us we are in touch with each other we will all do our best uh, same is true with all the psa guys uh, Everybody is chipping in and doing our best, and we will ensure that collectively we will be able to manage the third wave better than we did the second. And we will see that oxygen is not the crisis point for the next time at least. But we use this also to prepare ourselves for a future where this is a routine. This is not a subject that's going to stop us anymore. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much uh, for your uh, patience and uh, uh, responding to all the questions raised by our viewers. And now I'll request for Ravi Purshon for his closing remarks. Uh, thereafter, we'll present a formal. Uh... Yeah. Thank you, uh, Group Captain. And I think. Uh... Mr. Srinivasan, that was uh, an extraordinary session. Uh, I think you not only uh, gave us uh, a very good overview of uh, uh, how difficult this oxygen challenge was, but I also think you laid a kind of a roadmap of what we should be doing in the future as a nation and how we, we should look at, uh, be it the industry, uh, be it even the medical uh, hospitals, um, and also kind of demystified a lot of things around the oxygen um, and its usage, especially in this crisis situation. Um, I liked your, uh, you know, uh, uh, comments about uh, how, how we should move out of uh, the altruistic mindset that we all have right now uh, towards uh, a more ethical and, uh, and a business dimension there. Um, that's also very important, uh, you know, given what learnings we take from this pandemic. Uh, um, I think I truly enjoyed uh, the session and uh, I do believe a lot of participants uh, got a lot of enlightenment from you this uh, evening. 
um, and I do believe, uh, group captain, this session is recorded and it can be also shared with a lot of people who have missed. Uh, truly a very, very uh, insightful session. And on behalf of uh, Madras Management Association, uh, my big thank you to you, sir, for uh, you know taking time and uh, coming all over uh, and spending and sharing your uh, insightful thoughts uh, and uh, really look forward to a greater future for our nation. And as you rightly said, uh, we probably need to look at uh, look ahead and and look at how we how we come out of this crisis and use these small uh, respites we have got from wave two and prepare ourselves better for the future. Absolutely. Uh, so I think with that positive note, uh, I would like to thank you once again and also thank uh, all the uh, participants who could join us this uh, evening. Um, and uh, get a lot of inspiration from uh, the session today. Thank you very much. Uh, stay safe and uh, stay well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank thank you, you Ravi. And uh, on behalf of uh, things you are separated and you are staying at Pune, uh, on behalf of the Madras Management of Students and MMA, uh, this is what we could do it uh, till we get to the full uh, jab and also uh, no, which we could take care of everybody. On the behalf, we would like to present the under face mask uh, of N95 and also the mini sanitizer, which will uh, will go around our team, go around, present to the people, uh, so that this will really you know, take care of the people who really need them and educate them to do that. And uh, this is what we thought we'll do that. And uh, uh, all the viewers who are watching the program, more than 950 of them uh, were watching uh, various social media portals. Uh, some of you want to know the recording, all our events which have been. Uh, happening for the last so many months are available in our YouTube channel and also in Facebook, in our Twitter, and also our own webcasting. You, you can log into the MAA website. You can see the, all the recording. Uh, I think it will take another few hours from now. It will be uploaded. And uh, as the uh, president requested, stay safe, stay healthy. And uh, this, this so much of information has been given to us. And what I really wish you is that uh, you stay help and uh, take a jab. You don't need oxygen energy. So I think we don't have to worry about anything. The people need to worry only when you are going to get into trouble. Why should you go to that level? I think the best is to really improve your immune system, improve your oxygen system, your, your lungs capacity by so many ways of exercising yourself. I think there's so many articles that come. And the best is to take your jab as quick as possible uh, if you're not done one. And maintain the social distancing. Not one when you go out, wear a double mask. Thank you so much. Stay safe, stay healthy. Mr. Srinivasan, thanks once again. It's indeed a pleasure you, and a privilege to have you again. And uh, good night and take care when you come to Chennai next again. We look forward to seeing you. Sure, meet you. Thank you very much. Thank you all once again. Thank you.